ان الحمد لله نحمد ونستعين ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله Indeed all praise is due to Allah and as such we should praise him and seek his help and refuge from the evil which is within ourselves and the evil which results from our deeds for whomsoever Allah has guided none can misguide and whomsoever Allah has allowed to go astray none can guide And I be a witness that there is no god worthy of worship but Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the last messenger of Allah. Inna asdaq al-hadith kitab Allah. Indeed, the most truthful form of speech is the book of Allah. Wa khayra hadi hadi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the best source of guidance is the guidance brought by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa sharr al umur muhdathatuha and the worst of all affairs are the innovations in religion fa inna kull muhdathatin bid'ah for every innovation in religion is a cursed innovation a bid'ah wa kull bid'atin dalalah and all cursed innovation is a source of misguidance wa kull dalalah fi an-nar and all misguidance leads ultimately to the hellfire brothers and sisters after a series of khutbas on gratitude and patience these two basic characteristics which all believers should display faith is incomplete without gratitude and patience of course there are different levels one may still be a believer while one's levels of patience and gratitude is not as high as it should be but they are essential essential elements which form the foundation of the muslim character in the month of ramadan these elements have a special role to play we talked about them in general in life the importance It is also as important for us to understand how they apply in this month of fasting which we are now experiencing. In order to look at them we need to understand what were the or are the pillars of fasting. to see how patience and gratitude plays a direct role in achieving or implementing the pillars of fasting the main three pillars are those that were defined by Allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam as the goals of fasting <clears throat> the first and most basic goal is taqwa the second is tauba and the third is tilawa these are the three main goals taqwa comes from 
the verse wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said Ya ayu alladheena amanu kutiba alaykum al-siyamu kama kutiba ala alladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon Oh you believe fasting has been prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you in order that you develop taqwa Taqwa being a consciousness of Allah Consciousness not in the sense merely of knowing there is Allah because that is a form of consciousness but consciousness in the sense that one is aware of Allah in his or her life that Allah is aware of whatever they're doing and that awareness causes them on one hand to fear his punishment and on the other hand it causes them to be shy and ashamed to do what is displeasing to him on the third hand it also causes the believer due to his or her love of Allah to eagerly try to do the things that Allah loves most this level of taqwa is what Prophet Muhammad spoke about when he was asked by angel Gabriel about the pillars of Islam and he explained what the five pillars were then he was asked about the pillars of Iman and he explained what the six pillars of Iman were after explaining the six pillars of Iman he was then asked what was Ihsan and he explained that Ihsan was worshipping Allah as if Allah sees one or worshipping knowing that Allah sees the person because we cannot see Allah but having that sense of consciousness or awareness of Allah's presence not necessarily in his essence that his essence is mixed up with us here but in his attributes that he knows he sees he hears everything that we do so that level of ihsan this this level of faith called ihsan this level is what taqwa is all about it is to develop that sense of consciousness so how does one develop that sense of consciousness it is developed through the various forms of ibadah that is the purpose of ibadah when the prophet says, when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said describing salah he said aqimu salah li dhikri establish the prayer for my remembrance in order to remember me remember him for what purpose to be aware of him to be conscious of him so this concept of dhikr wala dhikrullahi akbar that Allah speaks about that the remembrance of Allah is greater it is the greater goal of all of the various aspects of ibadah and we said in Ramadan in particular since that primary goal is taqwa then it means that all aspects of ibadah done in Ramadan should be done with that goal in mind now where does gratitude and patience come in here of course gratitude and patience is what fuels taqwa because the ibadah the worship which will be acceptable to Allah is only that worship which is 
born out of sincere love, fear, hope in Allah. And we know, as we said in the very beginning, that Allah began Surah Al-Fatiha with gratitude. Alhamdulillah. So it represents the foundation for us to reflect on Allah. The gratitude, what Allah has given us in our lives. That we should be thankful to Him for it. We should remember His blessings, His bounties that He has put in the lives of each and every one of us. This should fuel sincere remembrance of Allah. Sincere remembrance. To be thankful to Allah during this month of intense ibadah. So in all of the things we do, whether it is in the acts of salah, or it is in zakah, or it is in sadaqah, or it is in the fast itself, etc., then that element of gratitude needs to be there. Also, in order for us, because the gratitude is what gives us sincerity, it fuels sincerity because if we are truly grateful to Allah if we feel truly grateful we really feel grateful to Allah then how can we take what Allah has given us and use it in ways which are displeasing to him difficult if we really are grateful but if we're ungrateful, then it's easy. It's easy to do it. So the difference between true consciousness of Allah in the facets of love, hope, fear, etc. and ritual consciousness of Allah is gratitude. Furthermore, in order to be able to sincerely worship Allah in this month, we must have patience. We must have patience to worship Him as He deserves to be worshipped. We can see it in Taraweeh. This is the area where the patience is tested. Taraweeh. To be consistent, not to search for the masjid with the shortest possible taraweeh. This is, it goes back to what is our intention. Yes, we can find one that finishes in, you know. So then what? We think about it. After we find a masjid that finishes express taraweeh, then we have all this time to do what? So what happens to the nights of Ramadan for us? What happened to the worship? It becomes nights of enjoyment and neglect and doing what is not pleasing pleasing to Allah if we were finding the express taraweeh so we have more time to do additional ibadah that's another thing but we know this is not the reason we don't have the patience to find somebody who recites the Quran at a moderate pace I'm not necessarily saying there's another level in the masjid at the vegetable market, you know, where he starts the prayers there at 12.15 and finishes at 3. I'm not saying yes, everybody, on the life, you can do it, it's wonderful. Okay, that's another level. 
That's going on now. And that is proper taraweeh. The best taraweeh. But at least the middle level where the Imam recites the Quran in measured tones. So we can hear that Quran as it was revealed. So Taraweeh is going to take some time. It will not be express. We can't do it. But it takes patience. Patience. Patience to control our desire to want to get out of there as quickly as possible. Knowing that the greater goal of hearing Allah's words is more important. And then knowing the area of the Quran where the Imam reads, we then get translations. So we read some of that. Or we read beforehand the meaning of what he is going to be reading. To increase our benefit, that takes patience. That takes patience. This is work. So this month of Ramadan, for it to really benefit us means we have to work on it. We can't just let it come and go. We have to put real effort into ibadah in this month. We have to realize the gratitude that we spoke about through this ibadah, through these various forms of worship. And we have to be patient to consistently do it. As the Prophet ﷺ had said that Allah you know, prefers from us consistent deeds even if they're small. Consistency even if it is small that we do it regularly. The second pillar was that of Tawbah. We know that pillar is a pillar of Ramadan because Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had said Man Sama Ramadana Imanan wa Ihtisaban Ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dambi Whoever fasts Ramadan out of sincere faith, true faith seeking his or her reward from Allah not from people through praise and etc Allah will forgive their previous sins. So repentance, purification from sin is among the pillars of Ramadan. Tawbah. And Tawbah, as we all know, requires us to be sincere for it to be real it has to have sincerity at its root which is why Prophet Muhammad had said that remorse is repentance remorse is repentance that one should feel remorse to be truly repentant. If one is remorseful, one truly feels remorse, then one will stop doing what he or she is doing. And they will make the intention not to do it again. Because they feel bad about it. And again, we said gratitude plays a major role here because when we consider what Allah has given us, then for us to do things which are displeasing to Him as a response, this is ingratitude. 
This is the height of ingratitude and we know it from our day-to-day -day lives. We do something for somebody and they do things displeasing to us. We don't feel good about this person. We feel that they have not appreciated what we have done for them. And truly, they haven't. As we haven't, when we sin, when we disobey Allah in our day-to-day -day lives, we are displaying ingratitude to Allah. In fact. We might say, no, 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 I'm grateful to Allah. I say Alhamdulillah how many times? Every time I always say Alhamdulillah. But those are words. As they say, actions speak louder than words. So the gratitude element is at the basis of Tawbah. And to be truly repentant on a consistent basis again it requires patience as we have said many times before the simple route for seeking forgiveness from Allah is just to say Astaghfirullah we've done it Astaghfirullah but reality is that when we say Astaghfirullah and we haven't focused on what we're saying Astaghfirullah for then what is the value of that? Somebody comes to you and says I'm sorry forgive me and you ask them what are you sorry for? what shall I forgive you for? and they respond saying I'm not sure something and I did many things, I'm not sure which one of them, whatever, but just forgive me. We have to question how sincere is this? But isn't that what we're doing when we just sit and say Astaghfirullah? What are we giving istighfar for? What are we seeking forgiveness for? We don't know. There are so too many things. But it doesn't work like that. How can we feel remorse if remorse is the essence of repentance? How can we feel remorse for something we're not even sure of? Can't. So our tawbah is undermined by our lack of consciousness, our ritual behavior, and the only way we can overcome it is to be patiently looking at ourselves. Self-evaluation. When we sit down to make istighfar after salah or in the afternoon, different times when we have spare time and we think to turn back to Allah and ask His forgiveness. In this month of forgiveness, then we need it takes patience to stop ourselves from just saying astaghfirullah and carrying on but to think evaluate what happened this week what happened over this last month the past six months major sins huge errors that we have made committed whether against our families, our children, our parents, <clears throat> our neighbors, in our workplace. Stopping and looking and sincerely feeling bad about what we have done. This will make Tauba real. And this then makes it possible for Allah to forgive our sins. It is not automatic. We have to make an effort. As we said, Ramadan is a month of striving, struggle, working, working 
to build our consciousness of Allah and to gain salvation from our sin. I ask Allah SWT <coughs> to give us the realization of taqwa in this month and to accept our tawbah and to forgive what has gone before of our ignorance and our ritual and customary forms of worship. I ask Allah to help us to turn our worship into true worship of Him in this month and to give us a new relationship with Him which will guide us through our life ahead in this short period that we are here in this world that we be blessed with His grace of consciousness, awareness, fear and love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذنب فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. I ask Allah to forgive myself and yourselves from our sins. And I call on you to turn to him for forgiveness, for only he can forgive sins. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. The third pillar <coughs> of Ramadan, Tilawa. Tilawa meaning the reading of the Quran. We all know this is the month of the Quran, as Allah said, Shah Ramadan, Alladi unzila fihi Quran. The month of Ramadan in which the Quran was revealed. This month was chosen to be ennobled by fasting, this form of worship, because the Quran was first revealed in Ramadan. We know that. So, how does gratitude and patience play a role? Well, we know that if we are truly grateful to Allah for His Book of Revelation, then we will love it and we will read it often. That will be the motivator because we're truly grateful. Here is a book, a book which contains guidance for everything and it contains with it, within it, as Allah said, shifa'un lima fi sudur, a cure for whatever is in the soul. Whatever sicknesses, diseases, corruption that we have in our souls, regardless, the cure is there in the Quran. That is the word, that's the words of Allah. So this book, this book which contains guidance, ultimate guidance for humankind, and at the same time, a cure for our most troubling problems. Because where are the biggest problems? The biggest problems that we face are the problems of the heart, the problems of our soul, these internal problems which cause us to be, have distress, cause us to be stressed, causes us to flare up and all the different things that happen. The Quran is the cure. Should we not be thankful for this? Well, if we realize the 
greatness of the Quran then we can through our gratitude give the Quran its right but if we don't realize it if the Quran is a religious artifact and actually in Islam we have no religious artifacts in other religions they have religious artifacts in Islam we don't have religious artifacts but for Muslims in the world today the Quran has become a religious artifact so it is bound in leather it is placed in the highest place in the house rituals have been developed around it whereby if it falls on the ground you have to pick it up you kiss it or even before you read it when you take it from the shelf you kiss it one side kiss the other side put it on your head people have all kinds of rituals you'll see amazing things that people do in different countries for the Quran and if you are leaving the masjid some people say you shouldn't turn your back on the Quran so when you walk out you should walk out backwards you have to check make sure you don't bounce into the door you walk out backwards and if whilst you're sitting there you put it on your lap somebody say hi oh, your Quran is on your aura Take it or if you stretch your feet out oh you're pointing your feet towards the Quran people are very you know eager to protect the Quran and look after the Quran but it is the artifact the religious artifact what is inside the Quran <laughs> person doesn't even know all he knows is that he must protect the Quran and look after it and treat it this way and that way and we even make Qurans that are one inch by one inch by one inch little Quran what for to read you need a microscope you know you don't carry around a microscope you can say no I'm keeping it for reading purposes it's small you know so you have to carry a microscope around with you every time you open the pages no we don't do this people are not making those little Qurans for that purpose they're making it to put it in lockets and put it around your neck hang it in your car put it in different places where it will protect us from evil but if you think about it this is like going to the doctor right he's got the cure and he writes out the prescription for you and then what do you do instead of going to the pharmacist to get the necessary medicine take the medicines and cure yourself you roll it up you put it in a little locket and wear it around your neck what is that going to do for us not too much people look at it and say it's silly and truly this is what has happened to the Quran so the whole concept of reading the Quran and understanding and benefiting being guided by lost gone because we are not truly grateful for the Quran our attitude towards the Quran is just the ritual it is only the ritual we know actually <clears throat> there were some uh, brothers who were telling me in, in China in Taiwan they had come across a family there brothers who were involved in giving dawah gone there for business and gave some dawahs they were there they came across a family in which they had hung in the middle of their house a Quran in a container hanging from the roof right they were in practice they were Buddhists like everybody else 
But after talking to them, I mean, he came to know that they were originally Muslims. They were originally Muslims who had come from mainland China and had come to Taiwan. But all that the earlier generations of that family remembered was that the Quran was kept in a high place. They had to keep this book, which was the essence of who they were in this high place. So eventually, the, the, the contact with the book was reduced now just to keeping it in a container and hanging it from the roof. That is the consequence. And in our own way, we do the same thing. We take out the Quran in Ramadan, beginning of Ramadan. We take it from the top of the shelf. We blow the dust off. Right? And then we start reading. We have one juice to finish each day. So we read. read. End of the month, you close the book, put it back up on the shelf to collect dust until next Ramadan. What is the difference really? Not much difference. We are reading something we don't understand. We are not reflecting on its meanings. Where is the gratitude in that? How is gratitude shown? If we are truly grateful to Allah for this book of guidance, then we should take the guidance. We should benefit from that guidance and utilize it in our lives. Instead of reading verses which curse us and we continue to do what is displeasing to Allah. So, that gratitude element missing doesn't motivate us to know what the Quran says. Better. Better for us to only read Surah Al-Baqarah this year. Two and a half Jews. To have read that this year. With understanding, with the meaning, read some tafsir of the verses that are not clear and we complete that in Ramadan, we have done something. We can take guidance from it if we understand what it's saying. We can't take guidance if we don't understand. Very, very important. This is one of the pillars of Ramadan. This can bring about change in our lives. But we cannot benefit unless we understand. And this is where patience comes in again. It requires efforts. It's easier just to flip open the book, read the Arabic, close it back, carry on. That's easy. Relatively easy. Much more difficult to read Arabic than read the English. What we didn't understand. Think about it. Stop and think, not just read. And you know we don't do that with any other book. You realize that? Every other book that we pick up to read, we read it. Try to understand what is it saying? What does it mean? Is there any other book that we have we just pick up and just read? Just read to read the words. No other book. The Quran is the most read book in the world. But it may be the most misunderstood. Because people are not understanding it. Not applying it. And if you think about it, this is the height of ingratitude. Allah has given us all of this and instead of giving the Quran its right, reading it at least the way we read other books. When we go to the library or we buy from the bookstore a book, to at least read it the way we read those books, we don't do. So what is that really? Isn't this 
really a form of neglect and an ill treatment of the Quran to treat it in a way that we would not treat any other book book which is talking about material things of this life would contain no guidance for us just entertainment or whatever we treat those books better than we treat the Quran isn't that shameful we just stop for a minute and think isn't that shameful this is the book of Allah guidance for humanity and we treat it worse than the common books in the marketplace so this requires patience to change this to work at understanding the Quran I ask Allah SWT to give us that patience the patience to treat his book of revelation as it deserves to be treated to make the Quran the life of our hearts as the Prophet SAW used to make dua O oh Allah make the Quran Rabi'a Kulubina life of our hearts Bring, this brings life to it we ask Allah to put the Quran back into our hearts and to love the Quran as it deserves to be loved and to reflect on the meanings of the Quran to understand and apply them and we ask Allah to make the Quran the most dear book in our lives in the lives of our families and our friends we ask Allah to reward us from this effort to treat his book as it deserves to be treated we ask Allah O oh Allah forgive what has gone before it is from our ignorance a legacy of ignorance which we have inherited O oh Allah forgive us for it and give us the tilawa of the Quran give us the true reading of your book as Prophet Muhammad وسلم, read to follow his example to make the Quran our ultimate guide Aqimus Salah